Okay, so for our final uh, couple of sessions, uh, I'd like to welcome so, Dr. Simon Hayho to the stage. Thank you, James. By the way, I'm, I'm really happy that I've, I've been put on before the raffle. And the main reason for that is I can guarantee I've got an audience because <laughs> everyone's going to be here for the raffle. So I, I'm always, I know I'm on to a winner if I'm before the raffle. So I'm going to start with an audio description because unfortunately I start with an image uh, which is up on the screen. Because when I say I'm from Bath, everyone wants to know what Bath is. And so I'm starting off with a big bathtub on the screen. And uh, the bathtub is actually a Roman bathtub. And it's got buildings around it in Bath stone, which is a very light honey-coloured stone. And it's a hot bath, uh, because we have hot waters in Bath, so the, the steam is coming up. And behind the bath, for those who need, uh, are interested, there's Bath Abbey, which is just rising out above the bath. So we do have, Bath is actually named after a real bath. People don't realise that, but we do actually have a proper Roman bath. And it's hot as well, so it's a much warm bath. But beyond that, I'm here today to talk about technologies, uh, which is one of my specialised fields. Um, I'm a reader at Bath University, or University of Bath as our Vice-Chancellor makes us say all the time. And that means I'm somewhere between a senior lecturer and a full professor. So not quite that good, but not, not down with the uh, pond life, down at the bottom of the lecturers and so forth. So terribly sorry about that. But what I've done for the past 25 years is look at access for people with visual impairment. And particularly nowadays, I've looked at technologies, but particularly mobile technologies. And not many people are cognizant of this or understand this at the moment, but mobile technologies are increasingly becoming the access device for people with visual impairment. And so I'm going to talk about it in two different ways. So I'm going to do an outline of the presentation. Now, as I said, I've been working with people with visual impairment. I, I teach as well, and I, was a, I used to be a school teacher as well. And I've worked with people, with, uh, both adults and, and children with visual impairment for 25 years. But this is about my latter work, my more recent work. And so I'm going to start off with a case study of a student I worked with in the Middle East, because I used to work in the United Arab Emirates in Sharjah. And I'm going to start off with a case study that I published um, of a student I call, I've ch changed her name, called Emma from the United Arab Emirates. If you're interested in the UAE or know about the UAE, it's in the Emirates of Sharjah that I worked. And now, then I'm going to talk about a European project I'm currently doing, which is run by the, and funded by the European Union, which is an interesting position to be in at the moment. And uh, that's working with museums in London and Madrid and Vienna, which is jolly nice. And uh, I get to go to Madrid a lot because I work with some museums about that. And we work with people with all kinds of access needs. Because one of the things about visual impairment, of course, is quite often people with visual impairment have other access needs. So people with visual impairment aren't just uh, a person with a visual impairment. They also might have mobility needs. They may have cognitive <coughs> impairment. They may also have hearing impairment. I'm, I myself am hearing impaired, so I know what that's a bit like. So... We work with people with all forms of access need and very few, uh, but we don't assume that people with one access need only need uh, one access need or, or some substitution for that access need. We work with all forms of access need and assume that people might need those extra forms of access need. But I'll just go through that later. Okay, so what is assistive technology? Has anyone got an idea about what you call assistive technology? So uh, how would you define yourselves, assistive technologies? Does anyone want to say? And what would you call an assistive technology? A magnification. Fantastic. So that's probably one of the most used forms of technologies for people with visual impairment. You either get a, a non-digital device, a, um, a manual device, a big magnifying lens, or you can get these very fancy magnifiers now. But quite often you can do the same job with an iPad, and quite a few people are using their iPhones now to do those kind of jobs. What else would you count as an assistive technology? Screen reader. Screen reader, absolutely. Good old JAWS and Ruby on Rails, things like this. So um, screen readers that you get on your normal PCs. And these are becoming more and more what we call ubiquitous. That means these devices aren't just on specialist equipment, they're part of your computer. 
So if you have an iPhone, you have Siri. Or if you have a, a, an Android, you have Siri. So an assistive technology in the old days, the traditional form of assistive technology, is an Apple digital technology that helps to improve and maintain the lives of people with disabilities. It's a very old-fashioned kind of understanding of digital technologies. In the old days, they used to be separate things, and you used to have to have them built separately. But they were very clunky, they were very expensive, and you had to have specialised training to work with them. So people who've been to special schools, for example, or schools for the blind, for example, I did my PhD as a with a study of Worcester New College, which was mentioned in the last talk. And Worcester New College trained people with Perkins Braillers. I, I've worked with it, uh, Perkins School itself in Boston. I was very lucky enough to do that, and they have lots of Perkins Braillers there. But the problem with that is that identifies you, number one, as being very different. You have a whole different set of technologies. You also had to spend an absolute fortune on these technologies and have to have specialised training. And what we have nowadays is mainstream technologies that do quite a lot of those things and require less training. So I've got on the screen here my definition, I'm, I'm trying to cite myself here, which is my definition of inclusion. So inclusion for me is a philosophy or a, of, of cultural equality with other people. So if you want to use traditional brailers, you can do, and that's perfectly viable, that's perfectly all right. But if you want to use a mainstream technology, not have to spend so much money, all of these other technologies are out there for you. You just need to have your awareness raised about these things. And the most important thing is that equality, which is the philosophy of cultural equality, should lead to some form of physical or and social inclusion and integration. So you, you can be part of anywhere that you want to be, any environment that you want to be. And does your technology allow you to do that? And the difference should not signify inferiority. So, for example, in the past, I've found that lots of schools think, ah, we have a person with a visual impairment, we'll put them in a special class, we'll teach them separately, we'll teach them as if they have some form of deficit. But this isn't the case, this shouldn't be the case. We should have technologies that allow us to work in mainstream environments. And that's particularly important for me, as I said, at the moment, because I'm working with museums. And we can't have separate museums for blind and visually impaired people and separate museums for uh, sighted people. That would be ridiculous. We want to include everyone within that same environment. So how do we make that possible through technologies? And so what I'm working with at the moment is another form of philosophy. And I hate to use the word the key word. I call it the philosophy word. But it's a philosophy of inclusive technology. And this is how I've defined this inclusive technology. Inclusive technology is technology that can be used with either no or minimal ad adaptation by a person with a disability as an accessible technology. So Apple, for example, are claiming that their iPads are accessible out of the box. Not quite there yet, but we'll talk about that in a minute with Emma's case study. But the point is they're trying. They're trying to take a mainstream technology like a telephone or a tablet computer and make it accessible to everyone. It's also seen as a technology that provides social inclusion, such as communication and interaction. So can you take this technology and go on Facebook? Can you take this technology and go into a museum, get an app for the museum, and find out about Van Gogh, for example? So all of these technologies have to be seen in different ways. So I'm going to give my research, ob research observations 25 years' worth on the back of a cigarette packet. And I don't know if I'm allowed to say cigarette packet now. <laughs> I did my PhD at Birmingham University down the road, and uh, I went into my viva, which is the oral examination for it, and my examiner, I could have killed him, said, put your, vi put your entire PhD thesis on the back of a cigarette packet for me. And I thought, how did So uh, ever since, I've tried to put all my findings on the back of a cigarette packet. So, I don't smoke, by the way, but don't worry. So the first thing is... The point, uh, the point that I found with working with people with visual impairment over 25 years is everyone needs to feel a sense of inclusion. What I mean by a sense of inclusion is, okay, you don't necessarily need to be in the same space as everyone else, but you need to, be, need to feel as if you could be, or you've got the choice. So there's a sense of inclusion, a sense of being part of the general environment. 
we all develop skills and habits that allow us to become included. Now, we do that quite often almost subconsciously. If we learn to use a mobile phone, I'm, for example, one of my very good friends is a guy called Barry Ginley, and he's the access officer at the Victoria and Albert Museum, and he's completely blind. He's lost all of his sight. He has glass eyes, but he uses uh, an iPhone all of the time, and he's a whiz with this iPhone, uh, far better than me with my Galaxy, which is rubbish, but um, he, he's a whiz with this iPhone, but he's actually picked up these skills almost by himself. He, didn't te- he wasn't taught how to use this iPhone. He's actually developed these skills himself. So people actually are quite clever about developing their own skills. We don't need to teach people too much. I mean, of course, you need to be taught the basics, but not too much. People would develop those skills on their own. These skills are shared in communities. So quite often, there are lots of bulletin boards out there. How do I use this app? How do I use Ruby on Rails? How do I use JAWS? And working together consciously allows you to develop those skills and habits and provide and develop your own inclusion. Now, this is particularly important because there's, there's one issue I've had with education for a long time. People like me, I, I, I'm against people like me quite often, is that they're very patronising in the way they put over inclusion. So we say, right, I'm going to teach you how to include yourself as a, in terms of mobility, for example. I'm going to teach you how to use a braille but I'm not blind myself, I, I'm just going to teach you how to do that. Whereas blind people I've found themselves, or blind and visually impaired people themselves, can actually develop their own inclusion quite easily. I mean, look at this conference. Quite, quite often, we have people who are blind and visually impaired developing their own conferences. So, in a way, it's about engaging with people to actually give them self-advocacy. And we were talking about advocacy in the last, uh, in the last session, but advocacy should come from the community that you're from. So the Anaridia conference, for example, is a great way of producing advocacy for people who are blind and vision impaired. And with that, I bring myself to my journey of realisation. And this is me back in 2011, 2012, when I was teaching in Sharjah in the United Arab Emirates. And I was teaching, generally I was teaching degrees Bachelor of Education, and I was teaching um, students computer science. I'm very geeky like that. But I came across a student who I was working with, and I was asked to work with. I called Emma, I'm not going to use her real name. And um, I worked with her to develop inclusion, because she was an engineering student, and she had a strong visual impairment. And just to put up, at the moment, I've put up on the board here, or on the screen here, uh, a citation for the paper that comes from. If anyone wants a copy of this paper, please just email me and I'll send you the PDF. Please don't go and buy it from Palgrave Macmillan, who would charge you a fortune. I shouldn't say that, should I? They're my publisher. But <laughs> if you want a, a copy of this paper, just email me and I'll send you a free copy. It's, you know, it's, uh, you don't need to buy all of these things. Don't, I, I shouldn't say that, should I? You need to buy these things. Very expensive things. Very good. They're very shiny. Good. So, back in Sharjah in 2012, I was a lecturer and Emma that's the name I call her, was an engineering student. She was an electrical engineering student, as it happened. And um, she was given lots of traditional assistive technology. And a lot of it was very expensive. She hated it. She was in the mainstream class with everyone else, as you are at university. There are no separate classes at university. And she was given huge Zoom devices, very inappropriate Zoom devices, although there are some brilliant Zoom devices out there. I'm, I'm not dissing all... Zoom devices, but she, she was given some what I feel were very inappropriate ones, and they were charging a fortune for these things. I mean, thousands of dollars for these things that she was given. And she was unhappy because she was failing her exams. It wasn't allowing her to take a full part in the class. She had some residual vision, but it wasn't allowing her to become an electrical engineer. And it was a dream of hers to become an electrical engineer. And it wasn't just the fact that she was visually impaired. She was the first generation of her family, not just to go to university or to a technical college, a degree-giving technical college, higher education. She was the first person in her family that could read and write. She was the first person in her family that had been to education because Bedouin communities quite often don't go to school, let alone university. So she was from a traditional desert community where, as you can imagine, if you have a visual impairment in a city, it's relatively, you've got relatively a large chance of going to a good school, getting mobility and so forth, you can use public transport. If you're in the middle of a desert and you're visually impaired, it becomes really, really difficult to be visually impaired. So in 2011, 
Emma had a cataract removed and a plastic lens fitted. And that plastic lens helped her somewhat, but it didn't cure her entire problem. And I know it's not aniridia, but it's a similar visual impairment. And then we looked at Emma's technology, and they were charging her a fortune. So, for example, um, I've got here on the board some of the technologies she was sold. And they sold her a computerized camera with an arm that cost 2,895 US dollars, an absolute fortune. Um, a large print keyboard, which was the cheapest bit that she bought, which was $65, but even that, $65 for a keyboard, that was pretty much. And she had some other equipment that cost her similar amounts. And it was, I, I felt, apart from anything, this was a bit of a rip-off, because she didn't come from a wealthy family. Lots of people would imagine people in the United Arab Emirates are all wealthy. They're not. She didn't come from a very wealthy factory. No, factory. Family. And so the only thing that she could really use in her classes, the technical classes she did, was an oscilloscope, which is a piece of mainstream technology if you're an electrical engineer. And I don't know, if you don't know what an oscilloscope is, it's one of those lovely machines you see on Doctor Who, or used to see on Doctor Who, with that bing that goes across, and it comes up with this little white line. But she had enough sight that she could see the, the light on the green background. It helped her. So her technology support strategy at the time was, I felt, poor. So I'd worked with some students with iPads before, particularly with visual impairment, and I found them to be good. So at the time, I sat down with Emma and I said, what do you want to do? Because we're going to work out an inclusion program for you, and we're going to try and come up with something between us, as I would do as I, as I used to do when I was a school teacher. But I wanted to give her some kind of power as to what she wanted to do with technologies. Because I had a kind of idea she wanted to, that I could use an iPad, but I didn't want to force her to use an iPad. So she wanted to be socially included, because one of the things she found was, even beyond the academic side, she wanted to be in class with her friends. Because she came from a close-knit Bedouin community, and she wanted to be around them. So anything that would also allow her to chat with her friends and to be with her friends was really good. She needed to find a cost-effective solution because her family wasn't that wealthy. She didn't come from an oil family, she didn't come from a high-up family, so she needed something that was affordable and that the family were breaking their backs at that time to actually afford something. And the most important thing she said was, I'm going to get blinder. I'm going to be blind one day, I'm going to be fully blind. At the moment I've got a visual impairment, I'm going to lose all my sight. So it needs to be future-proofable, if, that if that's a proper word. I don't know if that's a proper phrase even, let alone a word. But it needs to be future-proofable. I need to have a technology that will adapt with me to my access need. Now, the trouble with all these computer cameras and so forth is they were disposable. As soon as you lost all your sight, you had to throw them away. And that's $3,000 almost, 2895 down the drain. So we needed to come up with a way of actually helping her. So we... We tried the iPad, and I tried to persuade her to get one of these things. So we managed to go through the college, and we got some money together. And the iPad that we got at the time was an iPad 2, which was $580 in the UAE, which is expensive enough. I mean, it's an expensive piece of kit, an iPad or an iPhone. You imagine you can buy a I don't know, Huawei for like a few, you know, less than £100 or £100 nowadays. These things cost a lot of money. It had received good reviews. And this was the time, 2012, when these things were really being picked up as access devices. So they received good reviews from international organizations, like the RNIB, or the NFB, the National Federation of the Blind in America, or the Amer uh, American Foundation of the Blind. And we found many positive observations with this uh, case study. So we found one of the brilliant things was, one of the things she wanted to have most of all was literature where she could read and develop her English, because in electrical engineering, just like every other major industry nowadays, you have to be able to speak English, or if you want to program a computer, you have to be able to speak English. And it was a big thing for her to speak English. And so we've managed to find lots of free literature, which is brilliant. So the iPad, so it wasn't just the physical iPad that she could use, it was also the freeness or the low costness of the inclusion. She found that she could reverse the writing. So she found the black background with the white writing really helped her with the low vision. 
But also, at the same time, she could use the speech-to-text, as we mentioned earlier, and she could learn how to use the speech-to-text at the same time as seeing the writing and being able to see the writing more easily. And the most important thing for Emma was it was a fashionable mainstream computer. It wasn't one of these strange things that made her look different and she couldn't carry around. So it allowed her to be with her friends, her mates, and she could socialise with them. She could be on WhatsApp and she could be on Facebook as they had at the time. I don't think they had WhatsApp in 2012, but if they did, she would be on it. She loved this kind of stuff. And, And why not? She was a young woman. She wanted to be part of that community. She wanted to be part of what she was. So that was a big part of it for her. There were some negative observations we made at the time, which was the control panel was very complicated. Apple, as I said earlier, make this claim that it's accessible out of the box. Rubbish. It is. It is. is. Oh, it is. We we didn't find it so, though. It is. But it is. It is. Oh, it is now. Sorry. Maybe in 2012 they (laughs) prejudged the uh, um, uh, future proofability and all that kind of business. But in 2012 we found it a struggle. But now, obviously, it is. So, actually, I have to get back in touch with Emma and find out how she's using it now. I know she's still using it, because I'm in contact with people at the college. Um, she could read icons, but the icons were a bit fuzzy. And the icons weren't necessarily what they were supposed to do. So, some icons, you know, you get a picture of a camera, that's very obvious what it's supposed to do. Sometimes icons are just logos, and to her, they were meaningless. So the icons were a bit fuzzy, weren't necessarily able to be seen. Even with the Zoom facility, she had to hold the screen very close to her eyes, and that strained her eyes even more. And uh, the Zoom in those days, and you have to remember this is 2012, I'm talking as if it's the the last century or something like that, (laughs) but uh, you have to remember 2012, technologically, we, we move so quickly nowadays that it was quite difficult for her to hold it close to her face. And most importantly, there was a cultural issue. Because in the Middle East, you don't shout a lot. Well, you you try not to shout a lot in the Gulf region. Um, But the voice, she she turned on, and it was a very full-fronted American voice. And no disrespect to any Americans who are in the audience, but it was was this, hey, turn on this, do that. And it was a very in-your-face American voice. And she found that very inappropriate. Especially for a Bedouin woman who's brought up in a a society where you don't, number one, meet males. And she found it very difficult to relate to that. So at that time, we didn't have an Arabic voice, which was unfortunate. Or if there was an Arabic voice, we couldn't find it. So um, it uh, it was inappropriate to have that kind of voice. But it gave us the idea, or certainly gave me the idea when we were developing technologies, that technologies are a really powerful equipment, a really powerful tool, that allowed her some form of other forms of inclusion, not just engineering, to take an engineering degree, but allowed her to talk to her friends, allowed her to get on Facebook. It allowed her some form of empowerment, some form of self-efficacy. And she really enjoyed using this thing. It gave her a lot of self-esteem. So I took that into my following projects, and I wanted to develop technologies that produced self-advocacy. And so what we're doing at the moment in our... Um, and it's got a very long title, I'll just read it out. Accessible Resources for Cultural Heritage Ecosystems. And the reason we chose that word, well, I didn't choose that word, the the project manager chose that word that we're working on at the moment, is because it spells arches. So I think he started off with the word arches and then tried to find some ridiculous acronym that fits with... uh, It started off with a sensible acronym and then tried to find a word that fit with acronym. It could have been anything, really, couldn't it? alternative ridiculousness or something like that, I don't know. But we've come up with arches, so there you go. It's a word that everyone can remember. So the most important thing about this is it's participatory research that fits in with technology companies. So we're working with technology companies um, to actually develop inclusion for people who are blind, visually impaired, but also hearing impaired, and also people with cognitive learning disabilities. Um, but they actually make the choices about what goes into the technologies. So the technology companies listen to us, and we feed back after they produce something and said, this is a load of old pants, if it is a load of old pants, and we need to change this. So the most important thing is that it's 
technology partners and people actually developing their own inclusion. And this is a form of what I call technological self-advocacy. And it's creating inclusive technology. Because again, it's technology designed by people who are actually going to be the end users, not just spotty old engineers like me who have no idea about what end users actually need if they're honest with everyone else. So we have three project aims. To develop participatory groups we want to create inclusive cultural environments. So technologies, as themselves, aren't just the end. There's lots of engineers think technology should be the end of themselves. We believe that technology should be a means to an end. So if we can get people into cultural environments, like museums and so forth, then we've done our job with our technologies. And then we want to develop a form of in-depth research analysis to make sure this actually works. So we're working with technology companies, I'm, I'm pointing to the board here, uh, the screen, but I'll read this out, from Spain, the UK, Austria, and Serbia. And we have national and specialist museums. I won't read out all the museums, but uh, so for example, in London, we're working with the Victoria and Albert Museum and uh, the Wallace Collection, which is in North London, uh, up by, um, I'm trying to remember, Marlebone, isn't it? Marlebone High Street, you have this beautiful Wallace Collection which is a lovely, small, but national museum. In Spain, we're lucky enough to work with the Thyssen Museum and the Lazzaro Galdiano Museum. And in Vienna, we work with the Kunsthistorisch, which is German for Historical Art Museum, which I didn't know before I started this project, so I learned something already. It's fantastic. And by the way, if you ever get a chance to go to Austria, absolutely fantastic museum. I mean, all of them are fantastic museums. But that one is particularly impressive because it's very Austro-Hungarian. So now, those museums who had previously worked with what we call our stakeholders, the people with visual impairment, but also hearing impairment and cognitive disabilities, have actually worked with them to develop technologies that actually develop inclusion into their museums. And this is a really important process. And we do so, so through something called participatory methodology. And participatory methodology is just that, what I've described. People actually taking control of the process of their own design, their own education, saying, I want this in my education, I want this when I visit a museum. Not just being given something when they go to a museum because an education officer thought, oh, actually, I think I know what blind people want, they can't see, so we'll give them all, you know, whatever, no, no descriptions or whatever, as, as they used to in the past. In fact, when I started this uh, process, when I started this research, lots of, and 25 years ago, people were not describing colours for people with visual impairments, which is crackers when you think about it. People who have visual impairment quite often want descriptions of colours, and so they weren't being given descriptions of colours because sighted people thought that all blind people couldn't see. And so what's the point of describing a colour? So we've got beyond that kind of understanding now. So session participations started in London in 2017, began in Spain and Vienna, as I said, uh, in 2018. And we're running them through two universities, the Bath University, my university, and the Open University in good old, uh, what's that place down the road? Milton Keynes, good old Milton Keynes down the road. And I just want to very quickly, just to finish off, by giving a case study of the Madrid sessions that I go to. Because we've each been given an area at the Open University and Bath University, and I'm lucky enough just to have stumbled into the Madrid <laughs> project. And, and guess what, you know. There you go. get to fly off to Madrid once every other month and you know, go to terrible museums, oh how dreadful, see us wonderful art and stuff, what a life I lead. So uh, please feel sorry for me, please feel sorry for me. So um, I work, and I, I have to acknowledge the people I work with over there, Felicitas Cecini and uh, Jara, and Jara Diaz, uh, who are wonderful museum officers. And um, I'm just going to describe, I'll put two photographs up on the board, and these are the participant groups that we have. And so there's a picture on the left, which is an image of an audience attending a presentation in Madrid. It's a large lecture theatre with yellow chairs, and there are about 40 people scattered throughout the chairs. And we have these groups to do presentations of the technologies we're working on, and also the access to the museum, because we, we also talk about access and how people get to museums, what people experience when they ha are in museums, and what more they'd like in the museums as well. So it's not just about technology, it's about technology to give inclusion. And there's a photograph on the right with Felicitas Cecini, who's one of my colleagues. So I said she's from the Thyssen Museum, and she's looking at a person giving feedback through a microphone, probably enough, a bit like the one I'm holding now. 
And what do we do in part uh, participation sessions? Well, we think about what we want to develop. What kind of technologies are useful to us? So we don't just walk in there and say, well, you've got this technology, what do you think about it? We go to them and say, well, what would you like a technology to be? What's your ultimate technology? Give your opinion. If, for example, and as I found out, the Apple iPad is now accessible out of the box, but in 2012, if someone had asked my opinion, I'd have said it's a bunch of old pants at the moment because it's not accessible out of the box as it was then. We discuss what kind of technologies we use, so we find out what people prefer in technologies, not just assume that they prefer Brailers, for example, but quite often people <coughs> use iPhones nowadays. That's coming up as one of the most accessible devices. And we work together, so we actually use the technologies in the, in the, uh, the museum exhibition spaces, and most importantly, we get feedback from those live exhibition tours. So we actually do tours of the exhibits. So, activities we do. We experience technologies and document the results. The process we go through is we discuss the process of design and share ideas. And through our development of feedback, we come up with new technologies. And we're working with, as I said, technology companies in uh, Austria, Spain, and Serbia. Now, I've put up two more photos on the board. Sorry about this in terms of description. But uh, on the left-hand side, we're in the Lazzaro Galdiano Museum in Madrid. And on the left-hand side, there's this huge sculpture. And the sculpture is made of books. And it's a round football-type sculpture. It looks like a sculpture in front of you. It looks like a, a ball of books in front of you. And to the right is a group of participants, some of which are visually impaired, and they're having an audio <laughs> description, a verbal description, of that, uh, that sculpture there in the Lazzaro Galdiano. And the Galdi Lazzaro Galdiano itself is a very ornate palace in the background. And on the right-hand side, there are people who are a mixture of visually impaired and have cognitive disabilities and, and, uh, and, and uh, mobility disabilities. And they're using iPhones and galaxies in the gallery to actually gain access. So we're, we're actually getting feedback from these live shows. And we also create traditional technologies because some of the te best technologies we found are the least high-tech devices. In fact, they're incredibly low-tech to the point of embarrassingly low-tech. So in addition, there, I've got two more photographs here, and we've actually made tactile models as well. Now, you can see reliefs in many museums nowadays, but one of the things that came out, funnily enough what I was saying before, is we created, uh, with uh, people with visual impairment, um, three-dimensional reliefs of existing artworks in the Tyson and Lazzaro Galdiano. And, for example, um, on the right-hand side is a representation of Roy Lichtenstein's picture of a woman in a bathtub, which is rather interesting. But the thing that we found was people with visual impairment wanted very bright, striking colours in their reliefs. So that was one thing we managed to build into it. And I'll finish off uh, with one of the technologies we created in... in in combination or in, in partnership with uh, the blind and visually impaired people we worked with. And this is called a sprout, so I'll just explain this. There is a relief of a painting, and the painting that we've chosen for this relief is the Laughing Cavalier, which is in the Wallace Collection in London. And the Laughing Cavalier is a gentleman from, what, the 18th century, with a big moustache, which is curly, and he has a big flamboyant hat on, and the relief is three-dimensional. Now, it was originally made without any colour on it, so we have put a, a, a desktop computer in front of it with a sensor over the top and projected colour onto it. And the clever thing about this technology is, and I didn't invent it, by the way, I'm not that clever, but this is a, a designer from Austria came up with this idea, that it can actually track your hand movements and hand gestures and tell you what you're touching at that particular time. So if you've got your hand on the relief, it can actually tell you that you're touching the Laughing Cavalier's moustache, just in case you're a bit embarrassed by what you're touching. <laughs> oh, thank God it's a moustache. Thank God for that. That's all right. So, uh, and then it tells you a bit about Franz Hals, who is actually the artist of the relief as well. So you can imagine this would be embarrassing for that. And there's uh, another relief on the right-hand side of the sprite, which is a table fountain which is in the Victoria Albert Museum with colours on top. Now, interestingly, the table fountain is made just uh, has no colour whatsoever, but we've added colour 
to help it become more accessible to people who are blind and visually impaired who ask for that colour. So I'll finish now. Takeaway message. Conclusions. I've got three takeaway messages for anyone using technologies or uh, thinking about designing their own technologies as well. Technology is one of the last barriers to inclusion. It's good, inclusive practice to use technologies to actually listen to people who are actually going to use them. You've actually got to give people what we call the fancy technological social word, or sociological word, shall I say, is agency. Give people agency. You've actually got to listen to the people who are going to be your end users. And you've actually got to invite them to be part of the design process. But most importantly, good, inclusive technology can only be such if their use is followed and led by the, or tailored and led by the individuals that they are designed to support. Thank you very much. Thank you very much. Any questions for Simon? Hi. Uh, that was really interesting for me because I used to work in a, a charity that was essentially oh. a lost charity. Okay. Um, and actually, I think we might have been asked to participate in the ah. project, but we never did. Right. Because we were doing a lot of work around accessibility for uh, blind, visually impaired, but also hearing loss deaf people. Right. And the, That's me, by the way, yeah. <laughs> the stance that we were taking on it, really, was that it was the most important thing was to mainstream. Right. So what should happen in the same phone that, way that iPhone is saying it's accessible, right. we shouldn't be an add-on. And the way that we were trying to encourage museums or even the private sector to do that was to think about the purple pound right. and the consumers that they were missing out on and therefore their, their book and their Absolutely. Yep. because they couldn't access. Um, it, because it... I use assistive technology, but if the websites have come to access, there's one of the old styles suits me best. It's just the turn it black and have the yellow writing. Right. But then when I go into a lot of websites, it's not accessible. Absolutely. So um, I agree with a lot, a lot of what you were saying, but just very pro making it mainstream and making one you know, medium for everybody to be able to access. Absolutely, and, and I, I couldn't agree with you more. I, I think mainstreaming is my goal as well, which is the idea of assist, uh, inclusive technology. Just, technology. Just go on, sorry, please. Just please. Go on, just go on. One thing from, so what we were looking at, because we were doing some museum work in North Wales as right, well, right. Was it, and we did it a lot on websites, was to have um, accessible videos right. and embed them on the website. Right. The video would have somebody sign in yep. in BSL, it would also have a voiceover for people that were um, visually impaired, right. blind, and then we would also give subtitles for people that perhaps um, were predominantly BSL users that had some linguistic uh, spoken language skills, uh, but also then that was accessible for people with cognitive, uh, but also people whose first language wasn't possibly English, and that was the kind of USB that you I, I almost th thank you, well I, I do thank you for almost doing my job for me funny <laughs> enough we have persuaded several museums including the Quinta Storage and the Wallace Collection to do just that yeah. Yeah. on their videos yeah. so soon hopefully after this project we uh, will have accessible videos on some of the most important museums or in some of the most important museums we're still trying to convince the V&A by the way I won't mention any others. I should probably shouldn't have mentioned V&A. &A. <laughs> um, but yeah, it's been a real struggle to get that. But we are starting to actually get people to accept that. And the main part... Sorry, it, it just one... I was just going to say, you use that medium? Because maybe a visually impaired going to a, a museum or, or an sure. art gallery can't read it. Absolutely. But I don't want to go somewhere else to access a video right. while fully sighted people can read it. Can. Why can't we all just access the video? No, I completely agree. Um, the issue is that, so for example, if we put it up in BSL, we also have to, well, we, we certainly put voiceover on the video, and we've got the captioning underneath. There, there is an issue because some people culturally want separate videos. So for example, we've come across in certain parts of the deaf community, people who insist on signing alone. 
And this is it. And we, we've had a real battle with certain parts of the deaf community. Discrimination works both ways. Absolutely. Like uh, absolutely, and, and there is an issue with, with culture as well within the disability community, and, and I say that myself because I'm part hearing, and people who sign hate me, basically, <laughs> and, um, but, and it's a very strange thing that, you know... You use the word impaired in the deaf community, you should say hearing loss. Exactly, and... Sign and for absolutely. So when I describe myself, I could call myself hard of hearing, I, I just call myself the old-fashioned, and this is it, there are so many loaded issues to do with access that we're coming across a real minefield. But one thing I am doing at the moment, I'm writing the final report for the project because it's coming to an end in, well, theoretically December, but um, I'm writing the report for July. And we're actually putting forward some points from what we call key performance indicators, a very fancy term for how-to bits, for, uh, for saying how to make mainstream uh, technologies accessible. And we're looking at all of these issues, all of these points, to make mainstream technologies accessible. So the European Union, whether they act on them or not, will have a bunch of things in front of them that they then have paid for, so they, you know, hopefully they will act on them in the future. Any other questions? Um, thank you. Uh, maybe uh, um, off the topic, but I've noticed that the BBC is using much more description with different voices and uh, describing even um, in nature programmes what people are, what you're looking at on the screen. Mm. Is that a deliberate yes. new thing? In fact, language is one of the issues we're looking at as well. Because technology by itself is a dumb, is a dumb uh, piece of equipment, if you like. It, it, it has no, no point, no use without language with it. So all of these information technologies are based around the language. So you can come up with all your fancy pants stuff about turning you know, black and white screens and so forth. But the main thing is making the language accessible as well. So that is a huge and important part of what we do. Yes, very much. Anything else? So possibly a, a, a slightly different topic, but in terms of like inclusive technology, um, sure. you know, I, I, I love my iPad, and that is a good example of where a normal piece of technology that anyone can use has been made quite inclusive. Right. But I've also noticed something um, like washing machines and right. ovens and microwaves oh. developing much more like touch screen, almost all of them have touch screen right. uh, interfaces. So something that was semi accessible, like a washing machine, some buttons and some dials, although you can't read the settings, once someone's told you where they are and you've found a way of noting that down for yourself, you can then use it after that on your own. Whereas touch screen you get completely lost about what setting you're currently on and how to get to the setting you want. Um, so that's an example where technology sort of almost become less inclusive. You're three steps forward and five steps back, unfortunately. You're absolutely right. No, you're spot on. Unfortunately, we can do what, whatever we like in, in the museum environment, but we've then got to persuade domestic appliance people. No, seriously, I mean, this is a really huge issue um, to actually take on board these, these key performance indicators too. And that's why we're hoping to actually come up with this list of what makes a good technology. Now, we're doing it in a, a cultural heritage setting, an education setting, but hopefully it will trickle down, filter down. I think that's a process of educating engineers, not educating people with visual impairments, and educating or people with visual impairments, educating engineers. And I think there needs to be a, a whole cultural change, uh, what you were talking about as well. You sell it as well. Absolutely. It's potentially private sector. If you yep. tell them about the purple pound, Absolutely. You know, with an aging population that more people will have sight loss, they'll have hearing loss, yep. then that's what will interest them to make things and I, I think you're absolutely right, and actually using the word Apple as well helps, I hate to say it, because a big commercial producer like them, and they're now the biggest company in the world, I think, um, can do it, then anyone can. Thank you very much. Yeah. That's a really good point. Fantastic. Thank you. Oh, yes. <laughs> <Why not>? yes. <laughs> okay, uh, thank you very much, uh, Simon. I, also, I, I, I'm aware that in America, I think you can actually get a microwave with Alexa inside it. <laughs> Cook my curry for two minutes, please. I, I don't think it can stir it for you, though. <laughs>